say all the introductory words, etc. I see the sign has come up say the webinar is now streaming live. So we're hello to everybody who's joining us on Facebook too. Welcome back to St. David's Festival of Ideas for the first of our afternoon session. It's been a, a great day so far and yesterday evening was also a wonderful way to start. Our session today was this one is about mental health in rural communities. And I want to begin by saying that none of us are mental health experts, and that is not the perspective from which we're addressing this topic. If you feel you need help in that area, please do contact an appropriate professional. But what we would like to do within the spirit of the wider festival is talk about our own approaches to mental health self-care and self-care or care of one another within the community as well as Elinid who is both part of our community and within government speaking about the, the the wider political context the policy making context to support good mental health especially in rural areas in this session we have not quite 50 minutes now We'll have about 30 minutes of, of discussing together on various aspects of, of what we're addressing. And then we would like to open the discussion up more widely. So what I'd like to do is invite you please to join in by posting your comments and ideas because we'd really like this to be a sort of a sharing conversational dialogue rather more than just Q and A at the end. If you have comments and ideas, if you put them in the chat function, then everybody will be able to read them. Whereas if you put them in the Q&A, only we will be able to read them and the other, the rest of, of those who are watching won't be able to share. So can I ask you please to focus on the, the chat function and we'll, we'll be keeping an eye on that. Well, it's wonderful to welcome Jerome and Alinid because this time last year, we were planning to meet in the cathedral to launch I Pledge to Talk, which was an initiative that came from the Linid uh, for improving mental health and particularly in relation to the suicide of men within the farming and wider rural community. Of course, lockdown happened and we weren't able to go forward with that, but here we are. And I'm going to do a bit of introduction, even though neither of the, the speakers really need much in the way of it. Everybody who watches the television will know who Jerome is, whether it's from back in the days of King's Fusiliers or Soldier Soldier, or more recently with Game, Game of Thrones and so on. Or you might remember him for the Unchained Melody and his other number ones with Robson Green. But as far as we're concerned today, we're asking him to think about his, the way he is now rooted in Pembrokeshire, having come here as a child and then having bought land property here over 20 years ago and much involved in the well-being of the local community, land people in various ways. And I'm thinking especially of that fantastic quiz evening we had last July in, for the benefit of, of Shalom House, our palliative care centre. And Elinid, Elinid Morgan needs very little um, introduction either. Uh, roots to the family in St. David's going back at least far, uh, several centuries. Her great grandfather was the miller at Touravelin, and many of the family are still here and active in the community. Um, I'm just going to say hi to Teddy, who's joining us, um, because one of the things that we felt we needed in this conversation was a young person's perspective. So, Teddy will be will be bringing that, and we'll invite you into the conversation as we go forward. Uh, let me continue with the formal introduction of Elinid, who has represented St. David's as part of the rest of Mid and West Wales, both as a member of the European Parliament for 15 years and now as our Senate member. I mentioned that she has had long interest in, in mental health and was the initiator of the I Pledge to Talk campaign around three years ago. Even more pertinent is that last October she was made the Government Minister for Mental Health and Wellbeing and so we'll be asking for what she's been able to learn over that short period and what she's taking forward. And I'm sure she'll, she'll comment on the way that she feels that within St. David's, we are ahead of the game in many ways in addressing these issues of community well-being. And her hope is that we can become, uh, in some senses, a model to encourage others to, 
to similarly address their own context and their own needs. But can I start with you, Jerome? Uh, talk to us about what brought you to Pembrokeshire. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. And um, everyone, welcome. And uh, it's an uh, honor to be part of this, this, this discussion. It's, it's a little bit of a surprise. Wasn't quite, um, it, didn't, it happened a little bit by accident, but I think um, I'm really glad to be here. And um, as we never got to initiate the I Pledge to Talk uh, campaign in the cathedral, this is a nice way to also to kind of address that. Um, there's a context here, uh, the problem, the crisis of, um, of young people taking their lives in our communities hasn't gone away. Um, yesterday, a friend contacted me and a young man we know had, had just taken his life. So it's very alive uh, and very real crisis that we're facing. Um, so a little, and this is a huge subject and we could talk about this and probably should continue talking about it every day of our lives because there's nothing more important really than the health and well-being of our, of our communities. Um, it is significant, I think, for why I, when I came down here, first of all, with my family 50 years ago, we were uh, struck by the sense of community here um, by, and of the land and of the correlation between the two. Well, I wouldn't have been able to put it in that way myself as a seven-year-old then. I'm able to look back now and realize why we as a family coming from Kent, even though I'd been brought up in beautiful Kentish countryside, I can look back now and realize that our Kentish community had, had already lost so much of its uh, localized belonging and sense of connection to land and people and was already under the spell of this vast, fast growing uh, global uh, capitalist, consumerist, business driven, progress driven world, which has so decimated our communities. Um, but here um, in this beautiful outpost, um, I'd say was one that was probably one of the last places uh, it was affected always later. I mean, some of our dear friends, uh, the local old boys here, although they weren't so old now, we're all, <laughs> and I'm joining them, um, but some of them hadn't left the county when I, when I first came here. Uh, extraordinary. And um, there was, at the, the local pub was like a community meeting place. Uh, there was this sense of people belonging to this land and this place, which meant an awful lot to us. And I, I can look back now and realize that we all, in some sense, felt orphaned from that richness of community. Um, and it felt like coming home to us uh, in, in many ways. So that's the context. So when, when I moved down here, it was, it was a dream for most of, most of my family, I think, to, to come. It happened quicker than I thought here. And, um, and of course, in those 50 years since I've been, I've been here, we, we all know that, that it's really hard for us to retain the strength and the resilience of that community. So much has changed in that 50 years. But I do feel a great hope now in the last five years, I feel something shifting. And there are people, many people here passionate about um, regenerating our communities and uh, not necessarily going away and sticking around. Um, and um, so in terms of the mental health, I think for, for mm -hmm. me, I'm, even though I'm not a mental, def nowhere near an expert, I'm very passionate about trying to understand what makes healthy communities and cultures and therefore societies. And I, and I don't think there's any, uh, it's not a coincidence. I think there's a total correlation between the crises we are facing, the many converging crises as a species now um, in terms of the terrible ecocidal situation, uh, the loss of our habitats, uh, mm -hmm. our, the mental health of, our, of our, all of our citizens. And we can see it more acutely in our young people and uh, mm -hmm. let's say in the farming population, um, communities in our, in our um, 
mm. countryside, but there's a correlation between the, the global crisis and our individual personal health and well-being crisis. And for me, that all starts with uh, an understanding. If I, can, if I look back at my life, I, I sense something missing when I left school. And as I've been learning as I go along, I realize that I've got a deep ancestral, uh, indigenous ancestral lineage. Uh, my ancestors, as all of us were, were born with an understanding uh, of the, our own true nature, of what it is to be born as part of this interconnected, interrelated web of life. Mm -hmm. And the further we have traveled from that natural understanding uh, and self-knowledge of who we are, uh, the more mentally ill and uh, the more our well-being has suffered to the point, but because we've traveled basically away from our own nature, our own connection to nature, to the point where we can just treat it like a product and destroy it. Yeah. And so there's, there's deep wisdom there, which thank God is still there in our indigenous people. Yeah. With, without them, if we had managed, if the colonizing forces had managed to wipe them out completely, I, I, we, I don't think we would have a chance now. But it, it, it's desperately, desperately precious what they are still sharing with us. Um, so I think what is the heart of, needs to be at the heart of this regeneration is putting the young people and the community at the heart of it and, and to all be very interested in collaborating and coming together uh, in remembering together yes. what it is to live a connected um land-based earth-based life great um Jerome, can I sorry i could grab on I can now. Yeah, now. I think that's a really super scoping out of the of the grand territory that we want to address so elinid you are a person of, of this soil a child of this soil talk 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 to us about about your your input oh you're mute <laughs> Sorry, my, my daughter oh, yeah. just decided to have a disco in, in, in the shower. So if, uh, <laughs> if there's a bit of a noise, you'll understand why. Um, I, I, I think all of the points that Jerome make are, are extremely valid. And, and certainly I would underline also uh, the fact that actually one of the things that's happened in recent times is that, that we have lost those connections and we need to regain the connections. And whether the connections... Uh, to the soil, to um, to the environment, to the nature, to our ability to influence in the workplace, our ability to to be involved and engaged, and to contribute to our communities. Uh, I think all of those things are absolutely fundamental to actually needing to fix a problem that is becoming greater uh, at the moment. And it's clear that consumerism uh, has, has caused a huge problem. Um, and that one of the things we need to do is to, to understand the scale of what we're dealing with. So even before the pandemic, one in, uh, one in four people were likely to, to be living with mental health issues at some point in their lives. One in six people at any point in time. Um, one in 10 uh, mothers so, suffered postnatal depression. Uh, one in 16 people uh, over the age of 65 live with dementia. All of these things are, are, are things that we just have to bear in mind, the context that we're working in, in. And of course, if we start looking at certain communities, prisoners, for example, nine in 10 prisoners um, have a diagnosable mental health or substance misuse problem. So there are acute problems that we have to understand, but there are more general issues that we also that need to understand perhaps in a, a less medical context. We need to understand that actually when people talk about mental health crisis, there is a real danger that we, we over-medicalize the problem. And that actually it's those connections that we need to, to remake that actually doesn't take a pill. It, doesn't, uh, it may take some, some, some talking therapy, uh, but it's not necessarily a clinical intervention that is needed. And I think it's really important, certainly in the short time that I've been 
uh, Minister for Mental Health. I think there's a real danger that we've gone a little bit too far down the medicalization of what is actually a kind of broader sick society syndrome that is not going to be sorted out with a pill. Yeah, I mean, I, I, for those of you who are listening to Radio 4 start the week on Monday morning, you know, that was exactly the same uh, point that was being made there, that sometimes, sometimes medication is absolutely necessary, but sometimes it's tackling symptoms, whereas there are better ways of, of looking at the causes. Um, I can see Teddy nodding uh, at that point. Teddy, did you want to, to, to share something uh, as a sort of a, a general comment about what's been said so far from your own experience and perspective? Um, I could. There's what has just been said reminded me of a thought I was actually just having yesterday um, as someone who has been experiencing what would I say? How do I exp um, I've been having a, a mental health crisis for the last half a year due to some quite extreme trauma. Um, and I was, I was coming across something yesterday which was talking about how the narrative around abuse and um, things stemming from that is that people need to speak up about it, but that the places that they're told to speak up to is, you know, um, in their personal community and then uh, in the law. And that in the law, actually that, that, you know, going to the police, for instance, or ending up in a court, unless it is for the purpose of preventing harm to continue, is not very effective for the well-being of people who've experienced these things and often can be uh, worsening and that the other place that told up to told to speak up in community um, mm. doesn't really exist that well you know it's tell individuals and individuals largely have no idea how to address another person's well-being and mental health or how to help on their own um, and the conclusion I came to was that um, a community that has no ability to effectively and practice also no ability and practice of effectively organizing for the well-being of the people within the community is not a community you know um where there are people who come together to organize for issues and for creating things but we never come together to hear a member of our community speak about something they're struggling with and to say how can we help you that is it's a foreign concept in today's society. And personally, um, I think it would be the start of something truly different when it comes to people who are really struggling. Teddy, that's, that's inordinately helpful because I think that it brings the focus of our, our, of our session now back to the heart of what we want to talk about is, which is the creation of the sort of healthy community which supports the health and well-being of individuals within it. Um, because we talked about the, the big picture and Elin had mentioned some of the statistics of, of the way things were going, only need your own, how things have, have developed over decades even. But of course, the, the COVID pandemic has brought things into the spotlight in a very sharp way, sometimes making a, things very hard for individuals. But also I think, perhaps pointing up areas and signposting where we need to act, what does work, how we go forward. Um, Jerome, do you want to speak a bit about your experience through, through the, the last 12 months and your part within the community here? Um, gosh, <laughs> it's, been, it's been a 12 months, hasn't it? For for everyone. I, I, I also, um, I'd just like to second uh, and support um, Teddy and what mm. what she just spoke of. This, because this is also, this is a festival of ideas. And I think the idea of us community members having the opportunity and, in, and collaborating and coming together to listen and to speak um, whether it be round a fire or in a church hall, there's nothing that could be more important. 
we have we have to start locally. So I'm just that's like it's a top idea, Teddy. Um, yes, I yeah. Sorry. That one of the I want to say that that looking ahead, when when we are able to move beyond lockdown, although Zoom and other other platforms have allowed us to connect uh, online in ways that we perhaps wouldn't have otherwise. And I know actually I've been able to strengthen friendships with with people mm -hmm. at a distance. I think that we're actually going to have to work very intentionally when we are allowed to come back together physically yeah. in order to, to, to just create opportunities and in a sense practice because I at the moment I find if I watch a film on something on the television and somebody you know a character walks up and puts their arm around the shoulder of somebody who's not a member of their own household I find myself blenching and stepping back and our capacity to sit in harmony together and share openly and within the church context within the community context I think we're going to have to work at that. Elinid, do you want to, to uh, let's turn this into a conversation rather more than just one person talking and then another? Yeah, I, I think I think Teddy's point is it actually speaks to to the campaign that 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 we were started to embark on, which is I pledge to talk, but I also pledge to listen. Mm. And uh, it's really important that we we start to listen as communities and as a society. And I think one of the, there are not many positives that have come out of this pandemic, I must say, but one of the things that may have come out of it um, is, is the fact that I think people are more ready to talk about mental health issues now. And there was definitely a, a stigma quite often attached to mental health issues. And I think that as a result of the pandemic, there are not many people who haven't had a sense of anxiety at some point during this pandemic. We didn't know whether our parents were gonna make it through, whether our children were gonna um, just be knocked back in school. We didn't know whether we were gonna have a job at the end of the, of the crisis. All of that leads to anxiety. And that doesn't mean you've got a mental health crisis, but at least we've all got an understanding now of, of what anxiety means. And I think, I think there'll be far less judgment uh, when people come forward and say uh, that they've got mental health issues. So I think that's really positive. Um, mm -hmm. What we've got to do now, though, is to make sure that we, we put mechanisms in place yeah. uh, to address the, the huge challenges that are ahead of us. And I think um, further to, to the kind of broader picture that we need to bear in mind, the fact that actually, if you're scared of losing your job, you're going to get become anxious. Um, so we need to understand it's not a medical thing. Actually, we need to put economic uh, structures in place to support people, to make sure that they have security and that they, they have an understanding. And it's been very interesting to look at some models that have been uh, done in other places. Um, universal basic income, for example, in Canada. Very interesting uh, pilot that they, they initiated there where the levels of anxiety reduced significantly uh, when they introduced uh, a universal basic income. So this, I think there's lots of different uh, places that, that we need to be focused on. And I think there's lots of, of ideas for, for how we can address this. Uh, Richard Layard, um, who's a member of the House of Lords, has written a very interesting book on, on the, the new science of happiness, just analyzing you know, what is it that makes people happy and one of the things that he points to, and I think is really relevant here, is actually the need to make a contribution. It's got to be more, more than about you being the center of everything, that actually community is important. Con contributing to community, it actually takes you out of depression, uh, mm -hmm. feeling that you're contributing to something greater than yourself. And I think there's, there's real power in that. And just watching the way that the community in St. David's, for example, has stepped up during this pandemic, created a, a food hub that has identified people in the community that were struggling. And we didn't know the, who they were before, but now we know who they are. So all of that, I hope, will help to, to reinforce that sense of community. Um, ironically, in a small place like St. David's, uh, it may be easier. And I think that the challenge then is, you know, we need to crack this in places like St. David's, but actually there's a much broader piece that we need to to look at in terms of the, the bigger society as well mm. yeah, yeah. You? Yes, you <laughs> yeah just just like to pick up on Aluna's point about 
contribution and purpose. It's because one of the symptoms of this culture and, and society that has brought us to this point is it's, it's very hard for, our, for all of us, but for our young people coming into it to feel connected to a sense of purpose, of deep purpose, of where do I, what are my gifts as a sovereign being to what's going on out there? Because what's going on out there is very confusing. Very, a lot of it is life destructive. Um, it's not renewing, it's not regenerating of life. So to be, you know, we're, and that's, I think, one of, the, one of the great gifts of this time amidst all the pain and the hardship and the suffering and the grief is because we, we're at a crossroads. We, we know that as a race, as, as a society. And we know that the only way we're going to take the right fork and create the sort of beautiful future for our next generations that we want to is by coming together and collaborating and not being having to wait to be told what to do or how to do it. We have to do it ourselves. There's no, this generation I feel now are waking up to this great sense of purpose. Um, so it's actually extremely, and that's, as, as Alun had said, I think it's one of the best antidotes to, uh, uh, to mental health is for us all to be empowered and collaborating together as communities. We know that in times of crisis when people come together and we've seen it here in, in, in our uh, beautiful tiny city with things like the Food Hub and, and many people coming together and uh, starting to um, put together initiatives of restoration and regeneration. And, we, and, and what, could, what could be more exciting than actually um, making sure that we are creating a sustainable, beautiful future for our generations to come. I don't think there's a greater purpose. Um, uh, so it's a, it's, a, it's a really good point you made, Alunid, there. Teddy, I, at one point I thought you were about to, to jump in. Was there something that you wanted to add? I wasn't going to jump in, but I, I've been thinking. Um, it's interesting that you say, you're all saying, to have a sense of purpose. Well, yes, it's hugely important. Um, but the thing, you know, a big part of the thing here is, is that we spend, we live in a culture that is set up so that people spend the first 20 years of their lives being taught that they don't matter mm. and that they don't have a purpose. Um, you know, the way our schooling system works teaches everyone that how much you matter is entirely based on what you achieve and how hard you work and how, um, how well you meet other people's expectations. Um, you know, whereas uh, indigenous cultures have been mentioned and um, bless them and everything for their wisdom. There are indigenous cultures who treat people as they come into the world their attitude is this person has come here, they have a purpose and we need them. And we don't know what it is yet, but whoever they are, they must have something essential to contribute to this community. Mm -hmm. And so whoever they are, that is who we need them to be and to support them to find out who that is. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And yet our schooling system is not one either explicitly or otherwise, that has a focus on uh, what you can call self-actualization. Mm -hmm. The thing that people desperately want to learn about and spend those 21st years trying to learn about in everywhere other than the place that they're you know, told to be all the time. Who am I? What matters to me? What do I have to bring? Like yeah, all those things, you know? I think Teddy is, is probably worth uh, underlining the fact that just this week we have voted in the Welsh Parliament to have a complete overhaul of our Welsh national curriculum and well-being is going to be absolutely central to that new curriculum so it's going to be something that's going to be touched upon in in every subject area not just a kind of on its own thing that sits apart we've also um recognize that 80% of mental health issues start when people are children or young people. 
And so one of the things that I'm keen to do now uh, as a minister in the few weeks left I have as minister is to start on the journey to uh, redirect funding so that we are placing more emphasis on tackling the issue before it becomes uh, something that is more complex and more difficult to treat later. So early intervention, um, ideally, uh, if we get in there early enough uh, we, without that medicalization, obviously we need to recognize that there are, uh, there are examples where, where we do need that medical intervention. Uh, but the other thing is, is that um, one of the key things we've done in, in the Welsh Government is that our whole system of government now is structured on um, a system where we have a unique act in Wales. Every single policy in Welsh government has to consider how that policy is going to impact on the next generation. And it's got to consider it how it's going to impact on the prosperity of the next generation, uh, the, the environmental resilience mm. of the next uh, generation, the equality possibilities of the next generation, the health uh, uh, opportunities of the next generation, the, the resilient communities, the, the culture of the next generation, and the responsibility to make sure that the next generation understands that it has a responsibility to the wider world, not just to their local community. So all of those things in Wales are written in to, to what we are doing as a nation. And I do think that they, these, you know, one of the benefits of, of uh, um, a platform like this is to make sure that people understand that actually there is a quiet revolution going on already. Mm. I want, actually, I want, well, there's a question that's popped up in the Q&A rather than the chat that's sort of linked to that, which asks us about what are the challenges of actually redirecting resources to the places that they really matter? So there's well-being more generally. And I think there's also, there's also a question I've got here about how to bring treatment and support closer to rural communities, um, not least because of the, the way that sometimes adults are put under terrible strain because of the need to drive their children long distances to receive the treatment that they, that they need to get. So, the, so two questions there, resourcing and also bringing support closer to rural communities because distances matter. I think, well, the first thing to say is, is that actually we're already spending a heck of a lot of money in this space. Uh, we spend more on mental health than we do on any other aspect of our health service. We spend about 11% of our budget, about 780 million pounds a year on mental health services. So it's a, no small amount. The, the question for me is, is it, is it making any difference? Is it, is it being impactful? You know, we need to look at not how much we spend, but does it make a difference? And so that's where the real analysis is going on at the moment. And that's why, but so redirecting funding is always very difficult because of course you, you pull some money out of somewhere and you don't want to watch that service fall over either. Uh, and of course, some of these uh, people, for example, who are sectioned, you know, that's very expensive intervention. So we've just got to be very aware of how difficult it is actually to, to redirect funding. But to, to, to say this is too difficult means you just keep doing the same. And, and never actually addressing the, the, the problem that, that needs to be addressed. Um, on, on the uh, rural community, I do think that we need to recognize that there are particular issues in rural communities. We need to understand the connectivity issues. We need to understand that if people don't see uh, a facility and a service, they may think it doesn't exist. It does exist. Uh, and I think one of the things that I've been keen to do is to make sure that people are aware of where they can go for that support. So we've made sure that every health board has very clear uh, directions on where people can go for support. Um, Sarah, you'll be very aware of the incredible work that is done to support our farming communities. And Tia Dewey is an example. Dewey, yes, yes. That's great work done by you know, an arm of the church in Wales, giving support to farmers who live a very lonely life very often mm -hmm. and they need that support and it's been great to see that and the DPGA Foundation and uh, we, we've been pleased that we've been able to some, put some support in. Yes, yes. I'm, I'm just looking at what's pop, popping up in the chat and people have been talking about not just the 
the possibility of, of connection, but also the quality of the connection that there is. Um, you talked about Tir Dewi, which I think is largely operates through through and with the with the with the, uh, the Welsh farming community here. But somebody else is commenting that they have been volunteering as a telephone befriender in recent months and said they hadn't reckoned what they hadn't reckoned with was the effect that their calls had not only on the person they were talking with, but actually on themselves and their own well-being. And that, again, brings us back to that capacity that when we give, we also receive and the purposefulness um, that we have. Uh, there's another comment about men's sheds. Uh, yeah. Yes, says Jerome, say more. <laughs> well, just that it's something that has recently um, uh, and it's something Illunid was uh, encouraging us. Um, Alan York has set it up. So in St. David's, although I believe we're calling it the people's shed because we didn't. <laughs> um, but that's obviously with, uh, with the COVID, there hasn't been um, much opportunity to, to gather together physically, but it's formed and we have a place, we have a venue. Um, and so there's a whole future there. I think one of the challenges will be, I think, and it's also why I think if we, if, if it's a people shed and can be more felt of as a community shed, then there can be many wings of it. Mm -hmm. um, and part of that can be a place where hopefully the elders of the community and the youth of the community can come together. Because I think that's a really important connection. It's something we've lost from our culture uh, is the, elders voice and the young people's voice in the culture and the connection between the two um and and also just in in terms of um in terms of land and farming uh, as aluned was saying i see a connection there and a, and, a, and a real opportunity because land is crucial you know farming and the production of food and and bringing it back to our uh, to our local communities being sufficient enough in a county to be able to feed ourselves is crucial. And to be able to support these, um, the farmers who are there struggling, uh, many of them on their own, and incentivize them to regenerate, restore their land. And also I can see uh, bringing young people, local young people in to help them do that. So there's a, a collaboration at work in restoring our soil and bringing in mixed farming. So we're relying much less on importing uh, mono and uh, the monocrop culture. Um, I think land is crucial and coming back to all feeling connected to the local land around us um, is, is, is part of the whole picture. Yeah, and, and I suppose we, we in St. David's have a particular uh, capacity to be in touch in a way that those who live in more urban areas need help with finding ways to do it, I guess. But I want to come back as a question or comment really in the, in the chat about coming back to young people and schools and the importance of mental health and supporting that appropriately from early on. A question about um, mentoring within schools, particularly for those who, have, uh, who are struggling. Um, Teddy, do you want to, to, to perhaps either respond to what Alinid was saying about mental health in schools, children, young people, or, or the, the idea of, of mentoring? I can't actually see that comment in itself, mm. um, which I'd like to. I can read but... it out. Well, mm. uh, it says, we need adult and peer mentors within all schools, especially for those children with ACEs or who have additional neurological challenges, ADHD, autism, dyslexia, etc as these children are 40% more likely to develop a mental illness, often being a square peg in a round hole of traditional education. And so mm. a lot in that. Hmm. It feels very broad. I'm not quite sure. Mm. I'm, I'm glad to hear that the Welsh Parliament has, has been doing that because because it's, you know, what I've been thinking. Oh, sorry, I need to be clear. It often seems that legislation and law is not set up 
for the greater purpose of the well-being of the people, which in my mind is clearly what it all should be for, you know, in the UK government. Um, and I'm glad to hear that it's it's far more of a focus in the Welsh the Welsh part of it. But um, mm, I have been part of organisations trying to set up peer mentoring and also relationships between people of different ages for mentoring to support young people in a way that is empowering to young people. Um, so not sort of telling them things, but giving young people the support to do and find what they need. But I think that a large amount of the time relationships, it's about relationships, isn't it? It's about relationships, actually, mentoring and these things. It's all a relationship. Yeah. And especially with mentoring, it totally depends on that relationship and whether those people work together. Yeah. And, you know, just as in schools, you find sometimes people have real connections with their teachers and sometimes people don't. And it's mm. it's that strange divide of your staff and you're paid to take care of me. Um, and you might not actually know that much about my life or be that close to me or, or, you know, a real functioning part of my community that needs me or what's going on here. So it's actually quite a difficult one to answer. Um, would that make Should I tell you what we're, we're doing, um, Teddy, because we're doing, we've been really focused on this recently um, because we are very nervous about what could happen. You know, the Children's Commissioner in Wales has come out with a report recently suggesting that 67% of 12 to 18 year olds are lonely some or most of the time, 67%. So there's a suggestion that one in six as well of young people have mental health issues. Now that's, that's a time bomb and we mm -hmm. cannot just sit on that. We need to do something about it. So we've put significant support into schools now um, where we've got school counsellors and we're trying to get them across the whole of Wales. Um, and we, we've got uh, what they call the in-school CAMS project. So uh, the, the health support for children in schools is there. But on top of that, that's a school approach, but we're going beyond that because actually I've made a point of trying to speak to people who have uh, been struggling with their mental health. And I, and I think we've got to recognise People want different things. You know, there's not one size fits all here. Mm -hmm. And some people don't want that support in schools. Some people want it outside school. And mm -hmm. so one of the other projects that we'll be rolling out from April is what we call early help and enhanced support. Because what's happened, happened up until now is that lots of young people have been bounced around the system. So they go to their GP, they get sent to CAMS, to a kind of, a, a kind of medical route they get to the end of the medical route and they say, well, actually this problem is not a medical problem, but you do need support, but it's not my job. And then they kind of have to start all over again. Mm -hmm. and, and they just wait for months and months and nothing gets done. So the, the idea here, and it's a model that's already been tried and tested and we know it works, um, is that actually we get a group of people together and we recognize that you can't just do this as a one-off thing. You need to give the support in the community. So mm. part of this is about providing support and training to the people who are closest to that person. So making mm -hmm. sure that they have the tools to stand by these people. And certainly uh, one of the, the definitions of mental health is, is that you know, someone who has uh, no meaningful connections or, or a support or support system available to them. And that's what we have to do is to make sure that they've got those support systems in place but there's no point in that support system being stuck in a hospital because it's just not going to be accessible for the long term. Mm. Um, and, and just one other thing is, is that actually that's the children's side of things. But on the adult side of things, one of the things that we're keen to promote now is more social prescribing. So, you know, we've talked a bit about, you know, tell, tell us what social prescribing is. Sorry? Tell us what social prescribing is for those. So social prescribing is, it is uh, 
a suggestion it's been happening there have been lots of pilots and what the idea here is that if people go to for example a gp that they won't be given pills they are given a project to do or they're given a a uh, something to become involved with so it could be joining a choir it could be um doing some some gardening for the community and what we found there's a lot of evidence there's a, a place in in london uh where they've done a lot of work on this and it has been transformative mm -hmm. in terms of people's engagement because they then start a community gardening together working together growing things together and and these these connections with the other people that you're working with you're contributing to the broader community it's not a direct uh, medical intervention but it's a social intervention mm -hmm. that has very very good outcomes so that's something that we are hoping to to roll out in a broader way but i think that question that somebody asked about the quality of connections is, is really important we need to make sure that that quality uh, is is there because we need gps for example to to feel confident that when they're referring people that that they're not going to be let down uh, once mm. they are referred that sounds a lot more towards towards something that might make a bigger difference you know um i was with what jerome said about land it is something that feel people feel a lot disconnected with um you know what is connection to land and all, all those things but um something i've noticed as a really strange phenomenon actually is that people in this country most people in this country especially those within cities as was said rather than people like farmers who have a better sense of this is that everything that a, a human a person needs to survive comes from land land is the basis of all human life and there is nothing that we need to survive that does not come from land land takes care of us and so we have to take care of it and so you speak to for instance young people from south america and actually growing food and where you get their food is a really is a thing they're very conscious of and why it's so important and people the young people in the uk have have no no idea of this um yes and i just think it's you know again school is one of the things that disconnects people from that because you don't spend time learning any of those things you don't spend time learning what actually keeps a human alive um and a comment that was as mentioned about um, how Jerome mentioned elders and young people and it sort of um, hasn't been addressed is that that is another one of the things that school does is that it, it separates people into ages and means that there is very, very little relation between intergenerations, you know, even of a, a one or two year span, let alone people in their 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s and the youngest people who previously when we had stronger and uh, wider families yeah. were what created the strength and the ability of parents to actually be able to take care of young people or communities to be able to take care of young people because it, it is a lot for one or two adults to take care of even one child without I, anyone else to support them. Nadine, you know? I think I think you've hit the nail on the head, intergenerational, joined up, diverse, mutually supportive communities. And we've got like one minute to go. So I just want to say thank you to our panellists. And I want to say a huge thank you to everybody who's put stuff on the questions or on the chat, because there have been some remarkable um, sense of synergy amongst us all. A lot of complimentary comments coming through to support. And, and Teddy was able to pick up the fact that we mentioned the, the older generation and mental health there, but we haven't managed to talk about it very much. But I think that by and large, we've scoped out the area where the conversations must continue yeah. and where the dialogue must go on so that we can shape a better future. And I hope that perhaps all of the, the same four of us will be together in meet space 12 months on. So thank you to all of you. I want to just put a plug for Sarah Bynan's uh, you can watch all of the, the, um, the sessions, you can catch up on Facebook and Sarah Bynum talking about sustainable farming this morning is very much in synergy with what we've been talking about now. Wonderful. Finally, to say all of this is run through volunteers. If we're going to have a, a physical festival in a year's time, 
please do look at the donate button on the website page. But I'd like to say thank you to everyone who's participated through chat, through questions, and to Teddy and Alinid and Jerome. And I think that we're now probably going to be switched off so that we can start again with a fresh login for our next session in 10 minutes time. But thank, thank you all very much to everyone. Thank you. Thank you.